I've been studying about this International Earth Day, and uh, I was on the International Earth Day site, the website. You know, I'm trying to do a little homework. The original Earth Day on the March equinox, Earth's global holiday. Okay, so they, that's what we said. They celebrated on the March equinox. Somebody moved it to April 22nd in conjunction with Vladimir Lenin's birthday, although they, they won't admit that. But if you look on their website, they believe in drawing together peoples of all nations, cultures, and religions. There was a song in the 60s uh, by the Young Bloods. Come on, people now, smile on your brother, everybody get together, try to love one another right now. And all these hippies, Woodstock, they thought they were having this big celebration, going to get all the peoples of all the nations together, cultures, all religions, all background, and embrace one another in one big heartfelt bosom-squeezed hug. And I have to admit, don't laugh. Oh, to advance peace and justice uh, at Earth Care. That's what it says on our website. I didn't add that. I just clicked and copied and pasted. You know, when you see these centers for peace and justice, your red flag, as a Christian, your red flag should go up. You should know better than that. People today are so presumptuous. They think that you know, we're going to go back to the Garden of Eden. We're going to go back to the pre-fall world, pre-curse, pre-Adamic curse. In the Thessalonian letter, Paul wrote, he said, I pray for us. Pray for us that the Word of God may have free course to all men. He prayed, first of all, that the Word of God would have free course to all men. And I want you to pray that. You should pray that for the preacher, for our congregation, that the message of the gospel would have free course to all men. We're angels unawares. You know, you never know who God puts in your path. I would hate to think that I'll, I'll have to stand before God and to think that somebody was put on my path, not coincidentally, but through the divine providence of God and to think that I didn't take advantage of it for Jesus Christ. And then Paul went on to say, he said, uh, pray for us because all men have not the faith. And that is in the Thessalonian letter. I want to preach a message this morning about the gathering of the people. You know, shouldn't we have this great love for our brother? Shouldn't we have a great love for the world? I mean, shouldn't we have that rallying cry that some of these people today express that they have this motivation. They want to have some spirituality. They want to embrace all peoples, all cultures. Isn't that what Jesus did on the cross? The question I want to ask this morning is, what is our drawing card? Who do we lift up to rally people together? We all going to rally around a political leader? We're going to rally around a religious leader, a man, somebody with our own flesh and blood that we can see? Well, why do you think God became a man? Why do you think Jesus came down? And the Hebrew scripture said that sacrifice you would have not but a body thou hast prepared me. Jesus, the God-man, came down and took on a body because God knew that in order to impact the human race, he had to become one of us. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Beloved, what is our rallying cry? I wonder if you would count by the topics of the sermons that are preached week from week to week. What is the rallying cry? What is that which we lift up like a flag or an ensign, a banner on which we march. When I drove on 81 this morning to the assembly, there was a convoy of all the military vehicles. Did you see the 
all the, the weekend warriors, we call them. I think they're the reserves. They were out on maneuvers this morning and drove by all those armored personnel carriers and the, uh, the tractor trailers pulling the, uh, the heavy equipment and the machinery. And I couldn't help but clutch my Bible and think, onward Christian soldiers. We're not marching into war. That's not what the song says. I'm amazed how many people are taking that out, that hymn out of their song books. Onward Christian soldiers. Sounds too much like a fight song. Marching as to war. It's a simile. Use of the word like or as to make a comparison. We're marching as to war. It's spiritual warfare. What are we going to rally the people? Well, beloved, that thought is in the Bible. And as we're preparing to study about Earth Day, just wanted to share some thoughts because I saw that people today, some of the great humanists, what is a humanist? A humanist is a person who exalts in the measure of man. There are people today that want to rally us and rally the world behind their causes. But beloved, I, as a preacher of the gospel, I'm jealous for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The great prophecy in Genesis 49, Jacob, as he had his 12 sons before him, and uh, he was going to impart the blessing. Reuben had forfeited that blessing. God forbid we should forfeit the blessing of God. And Reuben, through disobedience, forfeited that. As the firstborn son, the genealogical line should have came through him. Simeon and Levi were murderers. They were hard-hearted people. And I can't imagine trying to be a preacher of the gospel and having a hate-filled, bitter heart. Simeon and Levi. The fourth son, Judah. Judah inherited the blessing. Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and here's what Jacob said, and Jacob was a prophet. And though his eyes were blind, he was a seer. He could look into the spiritual realm. He could look over the horizon of time as a prophet, as a prognosticator. And here's what he said in Genesis 49, verse 10. The scepter, that is the king's stick, shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Shiloh, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. This might be the best translation, the old King James. The word Shiloh is the Hebrew word. It means the gathering of the people, the rallying cry. The rallying cry will be surrounding the great lawgiver. He sits on the throne. He holds the king's stick. In fact, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And God will rally the people around him. I wanted to look at the NIV. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come. And the obedience of the nation shall be his. Yes, beloved, Jesus is the great king. He's the rallying point. Now, tell me more about this Shiloh. Well, it was a place in Israelite history. In fact, it was right in the Promised Land beside the Jordan River. It was one of the first villages, the first towns that Israel received in the conquest, the Canaan land, the Promised Land, when Joshua settled Israel there and they received, they entered into the Promised Land. They received their inheritance. There were land portions. And as they crossed that river, of course, the priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. When they hit the Jordan River, the banks of the Jordan, the waters were stopped, just like the Red Sea on a more small scale. The waters stopped. The priests crossed over. The Israelites crossed over. They came here to this place called Shiloh, and they took one big stone for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 big stones, and they piled them up for a memorial. You know, we need to have some memorials, don't we? Things to remember. As Christians, what do you think this table is over here? It's a memorial. Every Lord's Day, every week, we have a memorial. It's a holiday, a holy day. Holiday means holy day. I don't know if you know that or not. 
But Shiloh was a famous place because in the days of Samuel, this is where the Lord appeared. Now, God appeared to Moses. He appeared to Joshua. But in Shiloh, the, the word of the Lord was revealed to Samuel. It was a special place. And here's that town, village of Shiloh uh, on the map. It was the house of God in the time of the judges. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. This is the place where people would go and to hear the word of God. Samuel was the great prophet, the first of the prophets, in fact. And, in fact, I want you to turn to Jeremiah. One of the verses I wanted to add in here, because this Andy hit on this in his Sunday school lesson, and it really dovetailed this morning. In, in Jeremiah chapter 7, you know, just because we have a holy place doesn't mean we're going to be holy. Just because you attend a church, just because you go into a building doesn't mean you're going to take the Spirit of God with you. Because the Spirit of God has to indwell us. This Holy Spirit living in our heart is what makes us holy. Not a denomination to which we belong. Not some place that has stained glass, gothic architecture, flying buttresses, you know, vaults, ceilings, windows. You can have all that trappings of religion. That doesn't make anybody holy. You can listen to a guy who dresses up in robes and garments and all of the paraphernalia of religion. That doesn't mean he's speaking to you the word of God. And in Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 12 through 14, God is going to destroy Jerusalem. He's going to raise up the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. I'm amazed how many times God had to raise up some foreign army to punish his own people because of their disobedience. And here's what happened. He said in Jeremiah, he said in, in Jeremiah 7, 12, he says, Go now to my place, which, which was in Shiloh. You get that? It was in Shiloh. It's not there anymore. Where I set my name at the first. And see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people. You want to know what happened in Shiloh? God said, go back and visit Shiloh. It's a wasteland. Well, that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where Samuel was. That's where Eli, the priest, he had wicked sons, got involved in sin, turned people astray. And what happened? The Philistines overran, captured the Ark of the Covenant. Eli fell over dead. God destroyed Shiloh. Nobody's going to go to Shiloh anymore. The Philistines had the victory. And remember one of the two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, bore a child, and they said, what shall we name him? And they heard that, the enemy, that their husbands had died in battle. The Israelites were defeated. They had fled. The Ark of the Covenant had been captured. And they said, the, the, the woman dying in childbirth gave birth to a son and said, call his name Ichabod. You ever heard that name? I think there was a Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, novel, isn't there, about a guy named Ichabod? It means the glory has departed. You know, it's a sobering thought to think that the glory could depart. And you know, beloved, it, it happens in history. History has a tendency to repeat itself. You know, what happened to Shiloh in the days of Samuel, the judges and the prophets, happened in the days of, Je of Jeremiah. Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the temple, just as the Philistines destroyed it in the days of Samuel, 1 Samuel 4, 9 through 11. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it. And you know, each time God came back and gave a bigger and better covenant, when they destroyed the Philistines destroyed Shiloh. God still raised up the great King David and built a temple. They moved it to Jerusalem. And Solomon inherited the empire of his father David. But Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed that temple. Why? Because of idolatry. Every prophet in the, in the end of the Old Testament, all those prophetic books were warning it was going to happen, and it did happen. But you know, Jesus came, and he is the great king of kings. He's the great lawgiver. And he rallied the people together. But do you know Rome came, didn't they? And they destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. So, beloved, it's a serious business. 
But you know, the Lord is still the king. He's still the rallying cry. He's still the most important person in our lives. You know, we're big on the doctrines. I like to preach the plan of salvation. I like to preach faith and repentance. I like to preach baptism. I like to preach about the church being the kingdom of God. I mean, we need to preach the whole counsel of God, amen? We need to preach about the end times, and we need to know about these things so we won't be deceived. But, you know, if somebody were to ask me, what's the rallying cry in the Lord's church? I would have to say it's the lordship of Jesus Christ. The king of kings died, buried according to scriptures, resurrected according to the scriptures, ascended into heaven, sat down at the right hand, of the throne of God, Hebrews 12, 2 and 3, reigning, making intercession for the saints, and he's coming back, the lordship of Jesus Christ. How can you go wrong when we lift up the name of the Lord Jesus? Yes, he was prophesied. He was prophesied in Genesis. He was also prophesied in this great Balaam's prophecy. You know, Balaam was sent to curse God's people, and God changed his tongue and out came blessing uh, you've you got to be careful you should never we should never mess around with a child of God you know God told Abraham in Genesis 12 I will bless you and make you a great nation uh, etc etc uh, you'll be like the stars of the sky and the sands of the shore but he went on to say I'll not only will I bless you but I'll bless those who bless you I'll curse those who curse you. It's a, a serious thing. You never want to criticize God's people. Never want to criticize a brother or sister in Christ. And that was the sin of Balaam. And, you know, God sent an angel to, to destroy Balaam. He was riding on a donkey. And the donkey knew better. And God opened the mouth of the donkey. It's pretty bad, you know. If we don't preach the gospel, who will? Je they told Jesus, shut those little children up, singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. Jesus said, if... If, we shut, if those mouths were silenced, the rocks would cry out. The donkeys would speak the glory of God, even if it was by virtue of his creation. But what did Balaam say? He said, I see him, but not now. He's in the future. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of all the people of Seth. And so he's going to arise, the star of Jacob. Jesus was in the line of Judah. He was in the line of Jacob, a son of Abraham, a son of David. Isaiah, so many scriptures. You know, we were having Bible study this week. One of the great scriptures of Isaiah, chapter 9, we talk about it in Christmas time usually, that Jesus, his name would be Wonderful, Counselor, you know, Mighty King, Eternal Father. It says that the government would be on his shoulders. You know, it's not easy to have a government. You've got to have goods and services. You've got to provide for a defense. You've got to promote the general welfare. You've got to, you know, establish justice and tranquility. All the things that a government has to do. Who's going to pay for it? The taxpayers. We read in history the heavy hand of uh, some of the kings King John, he was so oppressive in England, had to, the lords had to write the, the Magna Carta because of the oppressiveness of, of King John. And uh, King George III, you know, that was such a burden on the American colonists, couldn't bear it. All of the taxes, all of the things that, the Stamp Act, the Sugar Act, you know, probably the worst thing about King George is that in those days, preachers had to be licensed, and the government would license preachers. How would you like to have a federal agency to regulate religion? We got a Department of Education, got a Department of Agriculture. Why don't we just have a Department of Religion and license all preachers uh, to preach and register your congregation? Well, I'm so glad we have a, a, a king like Jesus Christ because in John, it's, Jesus said, Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I don't know if you know what a laden is, but it's a load. If you're laden, you're carrying a load. And back in those days, they would have oxen, and they would put this yoke on them, a big heavy thing you had to carry on your shoulders, kind of like a backpack. You've got to carry it on your shoulders. The shoulders are the easiest place to carry 
uh, a weight. I don't know if you know this or not. When we were in wrestling, one of the basic moves is the fireman's carry. And that's the easiest way to carry somebody in the military. You carry your men who are wounded. The fireman's carry, you carry it on your shoulder. But you know who carries the burden of the government of the kingdom of Christ? Jesus. He's the only king, is the only president, head of state, that bears the costs of his own government. And it said that on his shoulders he carries that burden, like a beast of burden would carry a weight and carry a load. And, you know, Jesus said, uh, you know, exchange your burden. Cast it on me. Put your burden. And, and he says, I'll give you my yoke. And he says, take my yoke upon you. It is light. And exchange your burden and put your burden. You know, so many of us are carrying burdens today. The weight and the guilt and the cost of all of the, the cares of the world and the burdens and the consequences of past actions and, and sin. And Jesus said, put it on me. Now, who wouldn't want to, what a great deal. Who wouldn't want to get in on that? Isaiah 9.6. Who brings peace and justice? I love a bumper sticker. It says, if you know Jesus, you will know peace. K-N-O-W. But if you have no Jesus, N-O, then you will have no peace, N-O. That's my bumper sticker for this morning. Because Isaiah 42, 1 says, Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Take away all Christian civilization. You know, and Winston Churchill said that in a radio address to the people of London in the dark hours of World War II. He says, pray to God for his help and divine guidance, lest the light of England and all of Christian civilization perish. You know, I get goosebumps just by listening to Winston, Winston Churchill in 1938. But can you imagine... The Lord, Jesus Christ, take away Christian people out of the world, what would you have left? I wouldn't want to live in a world like that. Isaiah 42, 4, he will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. You know, it's true that Christian peoples have done things that are wrong. We know that in the 19th century, some of the, the great empires overstepped their bounds, imperialism, colonialism. There have been mistakes. There have been sins committed. And so you have people like Gandhi in India, and, you know, you have the nonviolent resistance. What did Gandhi do? He wanted to shame England because of for some of the things that were committed, some of the acts that were committed in India. But you know, nonviolent resistance and shame only works on a, on a people who have a conscience. Let me repeat that. Shame, nonviolent resistance, only works on a people who have a conscience. Try using that with somebody like a Saddam Hussein or a Stalin, nonviolent resistance. Try over it with the terrorists, the Shia, the Sunni, Kim Jong-il. Try with one of those leaders. You know, it just, uh, it's not going to work. And yet we lift these people up on a pedestal, don't they? Who was the first nonviolent resistant advocate? It was Jesus. He said, if somebody strikes you on the cheek, turn your other cheek. But he's not given an address in foreign policy. Jesus is talking about our interpersonal relationships. He's talking about how we have to long suffer, love one another, long suffer, be patient. People abuse the Sermon on the Mount, try to make it as if it's some kind of a political address. It was given to the church. It was given to Christians. Yes, it was given to the world, but it was meant to, to deal with our relationships among brethren. 
He will not falter. He will not be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. And so God basically was going to bring all the nations together. Why were there so many nationalities listed on the day of Pentecost? We have about 10 or 11 nationalities given. That's why they had to speak in tongues. I've said many times that God had to create languages at the dispersal. Babylon to confuse the world and had to scatter the people. But what did God do on the day of Pentecost? He reversed the curse of the confusion of Babel. And the gospel is preached. And that's why the gift of speaking in tongues was so important. Why don't people love Jesus? You know, isn't that what David asked in the second Psalm? Why do the nations conspire? Peoples plot in vain. Kings of the earth rise up. Rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. There's two people there, against God the Father and against the Christ. I was having a Bible study this week, and I was talking to, the, to a man, and I says, do you know that when you say the name Jesus Christ, it's not, Jesus isn't his first name and Christ his last name. And they said, you know, I never thought about that. It's not like the Christ family, you know, Mr. Christ and uh, Mrs. Christ. The word Christ means anointed. Christ means king. When you say the name Jesus Christ, you're confessing him and saying Jesus is the king. So the next time somebody at work or wherever it may be curses the Lord and say Jesus Christ, even if it's in a bad way, I want you to stand up and say amen. <laughs> amen. It's, so be it. It's true. I don't care if the whole world is hostile to Jesus Christ, I'm still going to love him. I'm going to fear him. I'm going to reverence him. I'm going to preach in his name. All right, let me digress. Why do people, they hate Jesus? I mean, Jesus is so helpless right now. You know why? Because he's a shepherd. He's a pastor. He's a gentle savior. Did he have long hair? He probably didn't. He had a beard. And the psalm says he plucked his beard out. We have all kind of artworks about Jesus. People manipulate his image, try to manipulate his legacy, but the preachers of the gospel are still here, still here today. When I was in college, I wanted to take a few education classes. Foundation of American education. Just in case, you know, it's always nice to have a backup plan. There was a saying on campus, you know, just it's nice to have a few education classes just in case. But I was sitting in class and I, I have my notebook. I don't, I'm not making this up. I took modest notes of the class. And I thought, you know, I want to find out what they're teaching the teachers. And this is 1989. So that's been a few years ago. And here's what our professor said. She said, uh, she was talking about philosophy, how everybody has to have a philosophy. You've got to have a worldview. You've got to have an M and an E and an A. Your M, well, yeah, that's your metaphysics. Metaphysics, what's that? What's real? What is real? What do you mean, what is real? Well, sometimes things aren't always real. That's why you've got to know metaphysics. Okay. Kind of like Andy was talking about, you know. Are we in this room, or when we leave this room, does the room cease to exist? Is truth absolute, or is it in your mind? You see, there's got to be, that's why that M, metaphysics, was so important. Because either you're going to start with, in the beginning, God, absolute truth, or you're going to make truth relative. And if you want truth to be relative, you've got to affect your metaphysical view. So that's your M. Then your E. What's your E? Epistemology. What is epistemology? It's how you know things are true. Now, wow, now that really rings uh, clear, doesn't it, for a Christian? We need to know what's real. I'll tell you what's real. Jesus agonizing on the cross is real. When they came to Jesus, he was suffering on the cross. They came to give him a little narcotic, a little tranquilizer. What did Jesus do? He didn't take it, did he? If Jesus, didn't, if Jesus took a drug on the cross, then what does that have to say to every church member when we got to take up our cross? That pain is important. We need that pain. We need that perseverance. We need that trial because it proves us. It's a fire, yes.
but we have to go through that fire. We've got to endure that fire of testing. We've got to pass that fiery ordeal. Metaphysics, epistemology. How do we know things are true or not? Axiology, A. Axiology, what is good? Now, how are you going to determine what is good and what is not good if you don't have the Bible, if you don't have a God to tell you what is good, what's blessed, and what is cursed? Metaphysics, epistemology, axiology. The last one we don't have time to go into, but aesthetics. What is beauty? What is beautiful and what is ugly? What is vile? What is sinful? And what is attractive? And I'll never forget, I, I wrote down word for word what this professor said. You need to choose a defensible methodology. We're going to ask some tough questions. Is the universe created by a divine being or did it come about on its own? We're going to kill your mind. <laughs> you are. We're going to rehash this. We want you to be uncomfortable. After we rehash it over and over, then you'll be comfortable. We want you to apply your worldview to your schooling. What is your role in the school? We'll do all world religions, Buddhism. We'll sit in a circle and meditate and do mantras, and you better be ready to defend this or else you're going to get into hot water. 1989. This past week, I was at the center of civilization, Bridgewater, 7-Eleven. In walks a woman dressed in uh, Persian pajamas, has a big red dot on her forehead. Now, I have some friends from India, a lot of Christian-believing friends, and they don't wear those dots. In fact, they told me, John, uh, the dots are kind of, you know, that's old caste system. Nobody takes it serious anymore. Supposedly, I said, what's that dot all about? Uh, about? And they said, well, really that dot is like to uh, shield away like the evil eyes. I said, evil eye? You mean if somebody looks at you and, you know, wants to... Uh, Threaten you to fight? Uh, well, not really, John. It's like a, a lustful eye. You mean like if you, you know, you're staring at a girl out of lust and desire? Yeah, that's right, John. But uh, the truth is only the elderly women wear them. Only the elderly women wear them. I can assure you out of the periphery of my vision, I saw that woman with a red dot on her eye. I was not going to look at her. And every time I went to get some coffee, she just wanted everybody in that place to see her. See my red dot on my eye? Yeah, you, you, you don't have that Indian Persian look, though. You just, you know, your Caucasian looks kind of give it away. You don't really look like an Indian, and I don't take it that you're a Hindu. I'm not. I'm a public school teacher. Let me guess. You, were, you teach world history, and you just happen to be teaching world religions, and you had a group of students. You put them in a circle, and you uh, offered up mantras and meditations to the Hindu gods. How did you know? Is a mantra like a prayer? Oh, yes, it's a prayer. In fact, I asked those kids to take those mantras home and meditation, and I said that they're not allowed to get on any electronic devices. They have to shut off their Facebook, their computers, their little iPads and cell phones, et cetera, et cetera, to help them to have better so that the, so that the vibrations could get through. Exactly. So basically, you were praying in school. Oh, yeah. The conclusion is so obvious, isn't it? You're allowed to pray in public school, just not to the God of the Christian faith. You better be ready to defend this or else you're going to get into hot water. And she added, and don't expect the principal or the superintendent to come and defend you. And she said, you basically, you've got to deal with angry parents and you've got to intellectually uh, humiliate them and make them feel like they're stupid. And that was the only way, she said, that you would have to be able to retain your job is just to intellectualize and humiliate. And, and I'll never forget what she said. You better never, there's one thing you should always fear, and that, of this, and that she said, is the power of one angry parent. One angry parent, she said, will have your job. Oh, I was so elated. I can't wait to be one angry parent for Jesus Christ. 
you know, we had a guy up here over on the east side of Rockingham celebrating the American Library Association. You know, what could be so, what could be wrong with the American Library Association? <laughs> Just go, have you ever been to the library lately and look at the guys on the computers? You know, we're worried about this guy selling pornography downtown, running this peep joint. All you got to do is go to the local libraries and see all the perverts sitting there at the computers. Praise God for the filters we put on. And if they can't get the hard, they'll get the soft. If they can't get the soft, they'll push the envelope as far as they can. The last place I want to take my kids today is at the local library. So they came out with the American Library Association. The joy of this kind of relations between a man and a woman, the joy of this kind of relations between two consenting adults, the joy of this, the joy of that. Marilyn Manson's, the long, hard road to hell. Celebrating banned books, American Library Association. We raised Cain. The American Civil Liberties Union was going to come to Harrisonburg. Well, the education professor went on. Is morality absolute? It is relative. Theology, isn't that funny? We're going to talk about theology. They're teaching the teachers about theology. The truth of the matter is we can do whatever we want in the public schools. There are schools. You want to send some tracts to pass out? Preachers can pray at the American flag before school starts. One angry parent can do whatever he wants. We can do it for the Lord, or we can just sit back and let the devil take over. Who is God? Is there a God? Is there one God or many? Is it a he or a she? Or is it just a spirit or a rhythm of nature, as the New Age movement teaches? Or is there no God living? And we are evolving, just going on. And there is no one divine mind. <laughs> you know, I didn't have to be a rocket scientist, and I looked around. You know, there were, in our class, there were a lot of girls, young ladies, and I could tell that some of them were upset. Not all of them were agreeing. In fact, I, I, very few people, I, as I saw the look on their face, most of them were shocked and in horror that a teacher of pedagogy, education, would be talking like this. And I noticed there, there were a couple girls who even had a tear in their eye because they knew what this professor was saying was against Jesus Christ. But like a boot camp, their minds were hardened. They were rehashed over and over. And that woman did kill some people's minds. Now, what did the psalmist say? Why am I preaching this today? Beloved, are we going to rally together around the cause of Christ? There's a great song, must, you know, must Jesus bear the sin alone and all, all the world go free? We're in a spiritual war. And we need to have every one of us side by side, armed, locked and loaded. I don't want to get in a foxhole, beloved, and find out that one of my brothers and sisters in Christ doesn't actually believe in the war that we're fighting for. Can you imagine over in Vietnam? There was a man in our church that we grew up in Ohio, and he was at a, town, a, a battle called Khe Sang, K-H-E-S-A-N, Khe Sang. Americans took a lot of heavy losses, and he was in that battle. And they gave every one of the soldiers a little shovel, one of those, something like we had in Boy Scouts, a little shovel, it took in their pack. And they were out on the edge of the perimeter, and they knew that there was going to be some hostile action at night. And all the guys kind of threw their shovels away. It was kind of burdensome to carry in their packs, and they didn't think they needed them. And Brother Jim had a shovel, and he was digging and digging and digging and digging and he dug a, a foxhole and he dug it deep and he got in it and there was a firefight all night long and when the sun came up when the light came up and it cleared there was a lot of casualties for our American troops and Jim's but Jim's life was spared you know beloved when we get in the foxhole with one another we both better be of one mind of one judgment, of one purpose, because we are in a war against powers, principalities, spiritual wickedness in high places, spiritual rulers. And beloved, if the devil knows that there's any division, 
any divisiveness, any backbiting. Destructive criticism, he's going to feed on that. He's going to capitalize. You know, I, there's a lot of things we could talk about humanism. I have people say, John, not another, not another sermon on humanism. Why, why do I preach so much about humanism? I haven't talked about humanism in a while. You know, you read the obituary of your professor, and by the way, do you want to know what happened to that professor? She was a young lady, not, uh, maybe just a few years older than myself. One day she walked into the class. She was crying. We asked her, what's wrong, professor? She said, I just dropped my two boys off at daycare. She says, I wish I could have just kept them home with me. That woman, let me tell you what happened. She was married to another professor on campus. He left her, left those two little boys, ran off with another man. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. In the news this week, uh, well, I'm sorry. We have another professor. I, I don't want to judge. I really don't. You know, the, the world is looking for joy. The world is looking for peace. The world is looking for love. Why do I always have to be the bad guy? You know, I'm preaching some hard things today. But I want to build you up. I want you all to be edified. I want you to love Jesus. Here's a woman, guidance counselor, professor of philosophy, psychology, an obituary. And I'm, I'm looking, you know, in your, in your obituary, you find out a little bit about that person, you know, when they were born, when they died, what their job was, maybe a little bit about their personality who they were married to, who their survivors were. Uh, you know, the last thing is, is, isn't it funny in our obituary, they put what church that we were a member of. Isn't that ironic? I mean, why do they do that? Do we do it just for the, the fun of it, what church you attended? Why, do they, why is it so, nific, so significant what congregation, what church you were a member of when you die? Why is that so important? You know, because either there's going to be life after death, or we're going to be like ancient Indians or Greeks or American Indians, and when you die, that's the end of it. You cross the river, you're annihilated, cross the river Styx. Either we're going to have a heavenly home and a Savior waiting for us with his arms wide open, or we're going to live and die as pagans. And you know, it kind of really gripped me to think that there was no congregation. There was no references to Christ, no references to a Christian faith. Here is a woman who it says, quote, embarked on a lifelong journey dedicated to humanism, aiming to help all those around her. That was the first obituary I ever saw that came out and said, my religion is secular humanism. Are we living in perilous days or what? Over in the Soviet Union, when you died, you either got an Orthodox cross or you got a red communist star. You know, I thought, that's kind of poetic, isn't it? Now, Orthodoxism is the, is the religion, the Christian re, uh, religion that the Russians know, but you could either have, a, you know, a cross or you could have a star. I wonder what kind of symbol. It's just a symbol. It's just an emblem. What kind of emblem are we going to have on our grave? Last of all, one more humanist. I don't know if you heard about it recently, but there was a professor, uh, Dr. Deandra Poole, at Florida A&T, Florida A&T University, and here's what he said. He says, I want each of you students to get a piece of paper and to write the name J-E-S-U-S, -S, and I want you to put it on the floor, and I want you to get up, and I want you to stomp on it. Did anybody hear about that in the news recently, Florida A&T professor? Write the name of Jesus on a paper, put it on the floor, and stomp on it. And you know, apparently, there was only one person who was brave enough to stand up and say, I'm not going to stomp on the name of Jesus, even if it's written on a piece of paper. And he was a Mormon. Praise God for the Mormons. <laughs> and I thought, you know, whew, 
Are we going to get to the point where Jesus said the love of many will wax cold? These are the sign of the times. Are we going to fight together? Are we going to stand together? Or are we going to swallow the devil's lore, hook, line, and sinker? Can you tell the difference between Christianity and secular humanism? Or are we going to be humanist Christians, Christian humans, Christian humanists, secular Christian humanists, secular agnostic Christian humanists, Christianoids, you know, half world, half Christ. Can we be half world and half Christ? What did Jesus say? You know, at least praise God for this professor. If he hates Jesus Christ so much, and I don't want to belittle all multicultural diversity teachers. Praise God, we have one woman here. When we had Ben Alexander in, she said, I'll put that flyer up. I said, we don't have the stamp of approval yet. We need to get some stamps. She said, I don't care. She said, I'll put it up even if it doesn't have a stamp. So praise God, not all diversity, multicultural teachers, uh, you know, are ashamed of Jesus Christ. You know, it really struck me deep to think that a teacher would want students to stomp on the name of Jesus. Does that bother you? And then I thought, isn't there something in the Bible about stepping on Jesus? You know, what does the Bible say, Psalm 2? What is God going to do? All those people who, all those people that want to row God, what is he going to do? He sits up in heaven and he laughs. And he says to his son, this day I have begotten you. I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of, your earth, of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces. You know, Jesus said it's better that you fall on that stone. You fall humbly and embrace it. Because if we don't fall on that stone, what does Jesus say? That stone is going to crush us and grind us to powder. Even Professor Poole, that stone will grind and crush him to powder. Kiss the sun. Kiss. The Hebrew word means to worship. Bow down. Do homage. Make obeisance. Kiss the sun. And then I thought, isn't there something in the Bible about stepping on Jesus. You know the world can't step on Jesus. They can try to step on a piece of paper, but they can't step on Jesus. He's in heaven. He's on the throne. You know the Bible says there's only one group of people who can step with their feet and tread on the Son of God. And who's that, beloved? That's you and I. If we go on sinning, after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there's no longer remission of sins, sacrifice, but a terrifying expectation of judgment, the fury of a fire which will consume adversaries. People died under the law of Moses at the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant? by which he was sanctified and done despite or insult the spirit of grace. Yes, beloved, there's only one person that the Bible says can step on Jesus, and that's us church members if we backslide and go back into sin. If we skip out on the Lord's Day assembly, don't encourage one another. Don't love one another. If we get weary, if we get lukewarm, if we lose our first love, that's the only type of person who can step on the Son of God. Beloved, you've heard the gospel this morning. Is there anybody who wants to stand and say, I'm going to be a soldier for Christ. I'm not going to give in to the whims of the world. I'm not going to be suckered in on their worldly, secular, humanist philosophy. I'm going to stand with Jesus Christ. Is there anybody today who wants to be a champion? Anybody today that wants to be a Christian? Confess Jesus. Do it now. Don't wait till it's too late. Everybody's going to confess. The problem is it'll be too late. Let's confess Jesus now. Is there anybody who wants to be a Christian? Amen. Let's come around the Lord's table.
In the early days of Jesus' ministry, he said to Nicodemus, he said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Then we find Jesus saying these words at the end of his ministry. He said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. We know that Jesus was lifted up when he was crucified. They nailed him to that old rugged cross. They picked it up and dropped it into a hole that shook the very foundations of hell. But Jesus was not only lifted up on the cross, he was also lifted up from the grave on the third day when he rose from the dead. Jesus was lifted up again at his ascension. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that he was lifted all the way up to heaven where he sits at the right hand of God. I want you to just think for a second this morning about Jesus being lifted up. He was lifted up in the prophecy as the serpent on the pole. He was lifted up on the cross. He was lifted up in the resurrection. And He was lifted up in the ascension. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17 that when Christ returns, He will lift us up from the earth to meet Him in the air and we shall be with the Lord forever. As we're lifted up to meet Him in the air, we could probably say in the words of the gospel song, with tender hand He lifted me. From sinking sand He lifted me. From shades of night to realms of light, oh, praise His name, He lifted me. And then after we have lived in heaven with God for several million years, maybe our favorite gospel hymn would be, Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. But for the present, as we meet around the Lord's table as we partake of the bread and drink the cup in memory of the one who was lifted up, maybe there's no better thought for us than this. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Reach to us this day, my Andy and John. Lord, we ask that you, that you help us, fill us with your spirit, Lord, that we are able to discern for ourselves the actions and thoughts, the ways that we've been, Lord, the ways that we need to judge ourselves rightly, Lord, that we come before you humbly, Thank you for forgiveness as we partake in the bread and the blood, body and blood of Christ, Lord, that we that we're able to help us each week to wash our, our clothes, Lord, to be stain free, Lord, from you. And we need to be uh, to open our hearts, to open our eyes, to be honest, to be true, Lord, to be without deception in our hearts towards you, Lord. We ask that you bless us this week to help us to stand strong, to help us to endure. Uh, we know that these trials you give us are for our benefit that we that we are perfected. Uh, we just ask that you be with us each day and help us each day to stay on the path for it. In this name we pray. Amen.